Jim Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, Commissioner Board of Prison Terms. Carol Bentley, B-E-N-T-L-E-Y, Commissioner Board of Prison Terms. Manny Guadarrama, G-U-A-D-E-R-R-A-M-A, Commissioner Board of Prison Terms. Stephen K, Deputy District Attorney, Los Angeles County, K-A-Y. Patricia Tate, T-A-T-E, next to Ken Victims. Out of here. Peter Nang. Spell last name. N-E-Y. And your function. Uh, camera operator. Okay. Uh, Paul Veronese. That's Paul. V E R O N E Z Z I. Sound public. Steve Fournier, F O U R N I E R. Special Services. Linda Deutsch, D E U T S C H. Report of Associated Press. Doug Brockner, B R U C K N E R. Television reporter. Officer Sloan, S L O A N. Correctional Officer. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Your last hearing. Then we will go 
to Mr. Nielsen, the far right, and he'll discuss the parole plans. Following that, I'll pull the panel and see if they have any questions. Uh, then I'll ask Mr. K, representing the uh, people of Los Angeles County, uh, if he has any questions, he'll direct those questions through the chair, and if you uh, desire to respond to those questions, you'll respond back to me. Yes, sir. Following that, uh, your attorney will have an opportunity to ask you questions directly. Uh, when we get done with the questioning phase, we'll go back to Mr. K, and I'll ask him to uh, make comments concerning your suitability for parole. Then your attorney will have an opportunity to make a statement, and if you want to address the panel, you can do so following your attorney. Uh, we also have a next of kin here today. Uh, the sister of uh, Miss Tate, and she'll have an opportunity to make a statement. Uh, if she uh, decides to make the statement, she'll be the last one to speak today. Then we'll recess, uh, we'll clear the room, the panel will stay here, we'll discuss your case, and when we reach a decision, we'll call you back. Okay, okay you are afforded uh, certain rights to timely notice, availability of files for review, and a right to present relevant documents, and I'll ask your attorney if she's satisfied that your rights have been met up to now. Up to this point. Yes. You also have a right to impartial panel. Do you have any objections to any of the panel members you see before you? Yes, sir, I do not. Okay. Today you'll receive a copy of the, uh, the tentative written decision. The decision becomes final in 60 days after it's gone to, to uh, Sacramento for uh, review. A transcript and a copy of the decision will automatically be sent to you and you have a right to appeal for 90 days if you're dissatisfied with the results of today's hearing. Today, you're not required to discuss the life offense of the panel, you're not required to admit your guilt, but the panel does hold as true the, the findings of the court. You came in here convicted of murder, and you're going to leave this room convicted of murder. Our charge here today is to determine whether you're suitable for parole or not. I have a documents list here I'd like uh, Ms. Fraser and Mr. K to take a look at, make sure all parties have the same documents. That's exhibit number one. primarily for the record. Uh, the first objection I, ha I have would be the presence of what I consider to be an illegitimate news show, namely hard copy um, as covering this. Um, I consider them to amount to the National Enquirer covering this. Um, the second objection that I have... Let me go that one first. Okay. Uh, they've cleared uh, the presence here through the uh, proper channels and they are authorized and they have constitutional right to be here. We'll note that for the record. Thank you. Um, the second thing that I will object to is um, the introduction of any letters that have been solicited um, by any party through the National Choir, the Globe, or the Star. I see that as designed to incite the public in my client's case and to essentially undermine the integrity of this board in considering my client's suitability for parole in terms of bias. So to that end, I will object to any introduction of letters. Further, I have not seen or reviewed any of those letters, and so I, before any of them will be introduced, I will request that we have an opportunity to review them. Here's we're all in the same boat. I haven't seen any of those letters either. So to my knowledge, no, they are not in our possession, so they will not be used. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, we don't plan on uh, bringing them here today. They apply to all five defendants, and they will be at a later time brought to Sacramento and delivered to the headquarters of the uh, Board of Prison Terms. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I am going to request from this board that we limit Mr. K's statement to the facts of this case as presented at the trial that my client was involved in, and not the facts from any other trial from any other co-defendant in this case. Okay, he'll uh, uh, hopefully be following the materials that we have here today, okay. and uh, anything that hasn't been submitted already uh, will not be considered. Oh, thank you. Um, and last but not least, I would ask that this board not to consider any um, pictures of the crime scene or pictures of the victims that have not been sent to us prior to that. Um, I, enough of it has really been said about this case, and I don't wish to have this board's integrity undermined by inflaming. I did not see any uh, photographs in the uh, C file, and to my knowledge, uh, we don't have any in our position. Okay. We're, we're not planning on submitting any. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is your client going to be responding to our questions today? Yes. Okay, would you raise your right hand? I'll swear you in. 
You saw me swear or affirm a testimony you give before this panel be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir, I did. Thank you. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read the statement of facts uh, from the, the hearing held on July 6, 1979. And that was at your, your initial hearing. Mr. Carlin, before you proceed, may I have the glasses? Certainly. Thank you. Officer, could you get two glasses of water from the prison? Stephen Facts. Referring to case number A267861 on July 25th, 1969, the prisoner and crime partner, uh, Robert Kenneth Beausoleil. Beausoleil. Charles Manson, Bruce Davis, and Mary Bruner together and separately went to the home of the victim, Gary Hinman, to solicit money from him. The victim apparently failed to satisfy the request. He was kept prisoner for a period of time, cut and stabbed repeatedly. The cause of death was ascribed to a stab wound in the heart. The body was discovered on July 31st, 1969. Under case number A253156, Referring to counts 1 through 5, these concern the murders which occurred on August 9, 1969 at the Polanski residence located at 100500 Cello Drive, Los Angeles. As to count 1, Abigail Ann Folger died from multiple stab wounds in the body. Count 2, the victim, Frykowski, uh, death was caused by a gunshot wound of the left back and multiple blunt force trauma to the head. He was also stabbed. As to count three, the victim, Stephen Earl Perrin, death was caused by multiple gunshot wounds. Count four, Sharon Marie Polanski, cause of death was multiple stab wounds of the body. And the victim in count five, Jay Sebring, cause of death was multiple stab wounds. As to count six and seven, of Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary. These killings took place on August 10, 1969 at their residence located at 3301 Waverly Drive, Los Angeles. Lino LaBianca's death was ascribed to multiple stab wounds to the neck and abdomen. Uh, this refers to count six, count seven, Rosemary LaBianca, the death that was ascribed to multiple stab wounds to the neck and trunk. Count eight, conspiracy to commit murder refers to the prisoners to the prisoner and crime partners conspiring to kill the victims in the first seven counts. Uh, this has gone over, been brought over a number of times. We've had a number of hearings here. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say about your involvement uh, in these murders yes. for your base hearing? Yes. Um, I've attempted on numerous occasions um, at these hearings to explain my involvement. At my last hearing, I asked the panel members to please understand that my statements are in no way an excuse. I am not trying to excuse my participation. They are not... Um, there's no, absolutely no justification. There is no way that I can justify my participation or excuse it. So I preface my statements with that and ask that you keep that in mind. Um, I would also like to state that it is almost impossible to explain to competent, intelligent people occurred um, 23 years ago from a now cognizant, aware, conscious position. And I ask that as I state what happened, you keep in mind that it is almost impossible to understand insanity from a sane point of view. And that's what I was living on, was insanity. Um, I had, through my own actions, been involved in drug abuse um, for approximately a year to two years prior to my having met Charles Manson. Um, I got involved in 
drug use and drug abuse, I think, as a product of being um, just young with no direction. I had left home at 18. I, uh, I'm not sure whether the panel members are aware or not that I came from a very, very dysfunctional family. Again, it's not an excuse. It, they are just statements of fact. Um, I came from a dysfunctional family of two alcoholic parents. I suffered um, sexual, sexual molestation as a young child from a family member and from people surrounding my family. When I left home at 18, I was extremely angry, um, extremely vulnerable, um, directionless, and coupled that with my own involvement in drug abuse and my own need to be loved and accepted from almost at any cost at that point in time, I became very, very susceptible to the times. And I ask that the panel members take into consideration the times, not as an excuse, but Charles Manson. He was an extremely charismatic individual. He uh, was attractive to me in that all my experiences up to that point led me to believe that there was absolutely nothing left for me to do and here was this person that seemed to offer me some hope in a somewhat hopeless situation and I know that might sound very strange to you that somebody like Charles Manson would present hope but he did to me at that time. Um, I have stated and in, in, in during the trial um, and through the years that I was in love with him at the time. My comprehension and understanding of love today is not, I was not in love with Charles Manson. I was caught up in needing somebody to meet my needs and he seemed to meet my needs and I misconstrued my need to be that of love. Uh, I don't think when I met Charles Manson and the people that I was involved with that my intent or my purpose was to end up spending the rest of my life in prison or having eight innocent people dead. That was not my intent. I think that there was a culmination of circumstances and situations and emotions and people involved that brought me to to the homes of the people that died. Um, again, there's absolutely no excuse. I take absolute and complete full responsibility for my actions. And whatever that entails, whatever punishment, whatever my life is to be is a direct result of that. I, I willingly, knowingly, and um, fully take responsibility for that. I cannot change what happened. But I do ask that the panel members try to if it's at all possible, differentiate between fact and fiction. I said and s spoke several different stories between the grand jury and the trial. There were several things that I said at the trial during the penalty, of the f penalty phase of the trial that were in fact not true. I said what I said at the grand jury was the truth. And I want, once and for all, it understood that what I have been accused of doing and what I actually did are two different things. I sit before you a convicted 
murderess. I understand that. I was convicted by a jury of my peers of participating in horrible, gruesome crimes. Um, nothing will ever change that. Nothing will ever bring back the victims. But I'm asking that you believe me when I tell you I did not kill anybody. I did not by my own hand kill any human being. I was there. I participated. I did nothing to stop what was going on. That is inexcusable behavior. That is something that I live with every day. That is something I will live with every day for the rest of my life. During the penalty phase of my trial, I had stated, after consulting with Charles Manson, his attorneys, and my co-defendants, I was asked by Charles Manson to take the heat off of him, off of my co-defendants, and to state that I did things that I did not do. And I did that. I was still under the influence of Charles Manson during my trial. And during the penalty phase of my trial, I had stated that I had stabbed Sharon Tate when in fact I did not. And I ask your indulgence uh, in that if you were to read the coroner's report, if you were to read the police report, all of the stab wounds of all of the victims were made by the same weapon. And it was not the weapon that was found in the house, which was the weapon that I had that I lost in, in the house. It almost seems pointless to me to try to make this point. It's like, what's the use? I've been convicted. People believe I killed this woman. Does it make any difference whether I did or I didn't as to my suitability for parole? And I think that to unless I face the truth. I was incapable of feeling remorse until I really looked at the truth. And I just, I really, um, what's in my heart. <laughs> my lawyer is here telling me not to cry. You covered uh, an awful lot of material. Let me uh, ask you a couple questions, then you can sure. continue. Sure, sure, that will help. Were you present yes. at the, uh, when all these murders yes, took place? Yes, I was. All of them? No, I was not present at the murder. That you were convicted of? I was present when Gary Hinman died. I was present at the Tate House. I was not present in the home of the LaBiancas. I was in a car, and I left the, the residence of the LaBiancas before they were called. But you had been there? I had been there. Yes. yes. And what were you doing when all this killing was going on? When Gary Hammond was being killed, um, there um, after he had been wounded I went to a store and got um, I think hydrogen peroxide and band-aids and stuff to help clean up his wound because I did not know at that point in time that he was going to die 
I had a suspicion of it, but I didn't know. And again, I was not, please understand, I was not in my right mind. Doesn't again excuse it, but I was not thinking clearly. Um, Were you present when he died? I was outside the house when he was dying. I was in the kitchen when he was being stabbed. I had stated at, the, his, at my trial for his death that I had killed him when I in fact did not. And I made that statement because I was exhausted. I was asked to make that statement and I wanted to get out of the courtrooms. So I had already been sentenced to death and I didn't see any point in going through a trial. So I had admitted to killing Gary Hinman when in fact I did not. Who killed Gary Hinman? Robert Wilson. Okay. Now the other murders. The uh, Tate residence. You were there. I was there. And what were you doing when all this? When I when I was told to get into the car and go with Tex Watson, I did not know exactly what was going to happen. I was told to do what Tex said to do, and so I got in the car and did just exactly what Tex said to do. When he told me to climb over a fence, I climbed over a fence. When he told me to hide in the bushes, I hid in the bushes. When Stephen Parent was killed, I was in the bushes and I was watching. Um, when I was told to go into the house, I went into the house. I was then told to go into the back room and see how many people were there. And I went into the back of the hallway and saw how many people were there and came back and told Tex Watson how many people were there. Um, at one point, I was told and instructed to tie up for Tchaikovsky, and I tied him up with a towel. And at one point, I was told to kill him, and I was incapable of doing it. I had raised the knife to do it, and I could not do it. And at that point in time, Bochek Vykowski knew that, and he then jumped on me, and he and I got into a struggle, and I started screaming for help. Um, and when Tex Watson came and took him off of me, I was told, Tex was screaming at me and told me to watch the other woman that was there and that happened to have been Sharon Tate and I sat in front of her until Tex came back and then he When you sat in front of her, what were you doing? Were you holding her hostage? No, I was just sitting in front of her and Just trying to get away? No She was tied up, I believe she was tied up Did she say anything to you? Yes What'd she say? She asked me to let her baby did. What'd you say to her? I told her that I didn't have any mercy on her. Was she physically hurt at that? No. Just tied up? She's just tied up. Okay, any others? Where were they? Uh, Abigail Folger had run out of the house. J.C. Brain was lying on the floor and he had been shot. None at all? No. Who was the leader? Tex Watson. Were any of the females there in a power of position? Uh, no. Position of power? No. None at all? No. Uh, I'm not sure. No. None at all? No. Uh, I'm going to... Just refer to you. You already talked about this, and I'm just curious. Uh, in the uh, probation officer's report, it's page number eight, it says the defendant commented with some bitterness that she was not even present at the La Bianca thing. Nevertheless, she was convicted. I killed Sharon T. I don't know why I killed her. I was on acid. Whenever someone tells me not to do something, I do it. She said, Don't, so I did. As far as she recalls, the reason for going to that particular location was to help. Get Bobby Busselay out of jail. Uh, why didn't you take responsibility for killing my Bianca? So if you took responsibility for killing Sharon Tate. Um, I mean, you, I mean, you were very emphatically denied that you had any involvement with La Bianca. Because I wasn't in the house. Uh -huh. 
I didn't enter. I never entered the house at the lobby office. Okay. But in this case, you just told us you didn't kill Sheriff Tate. That's right. But I, I, I don't understand why you take credit for it. Then. You, I, I understand I, what you told Again, me. I'm asking you to understand that when I made that statement almost 23 years ago, 22, 23 mm -hmm. years ago, I was still under the influence of the drugs, even though I hadn't been on drugs at the time that I made that statement for some time. You can understand anything about drug abuse and the psychology of drug abuse, that it stays with you for a long time. Um, again, I was still very angry. I was still very much devoted to Manson and to the family, um, as I had understood them to be at that point in time. And I wanted to be a viable member of that. And I knew what had transpired, and I had guilt over what had transpired, but I had buried that so deep because I just didn't want to face it. I didn't want to admit it. I didn't want to face it. I didn't want to deal with it. And I used to hear Charlie in my head over and over and over again tell me things like, when you're in jail and people pick on you, you be big, you be bad, and you be mean. So much so that everybody will just leave you alone. I was very frightened. Um, I had nobody, no support mechanism around me. And I remembered that when people would question me as to why I was in jail, all I knew is that I had to somehow convince people that I was big, I was bad, I was mean, leave me alone, stay away from me in order to survive. Because I thought I was going to die in prison. I thought I was going to die in jail. I didn't know any other means of surviving. So I said things to people in jail as a defense mechanism. And I said I did things that I, in fact, did not do. Because that's how I was taught to behave when you're in jail. That's why I said what I said. That's why I didn't take responsibility. What happened? Uh, what you do after all the murders that take place? What did your group do? Um, we had stayed at Spawn's Ranch, if I remember correctly. You went immediately back. I went back to I went back to Spawn's Ranch with Tex Watson, um, and the way Spawn's Ranch was set up, there were like uh, movie fronts, and I went into one of the rooms, and Tex went in and he was talking to Charlie about what had happened, and I went into the room directly next to them. And I remember there was a mattress there, and I, I remember Tex telling Charlie what occurred. And um, I got sick to my stomach, and I passed out. Okay. Did you take any property from I the home? I personally didn't know, and I don't remember whether property Is there anything else you would like to say about the crime? There, I'm sure there's going to be questions, more questions later on. Um, No, sir, I did not. I was with two gentlemen who had it. And how did you happen to do that? 
Um, one of the gentlemen, um, Albert Sun. Um, I left a job that I had in San Francisco and got in his car and went with him. I thought I was in love with him. And on the way to between Sacramento and the Oregon border, I was told that um, I was riding in a stolen car and that they were both on the lam. I had no idea what on the lam meant, and when I asked what on the lam meant, I was told that they were both um, ex-convicts. They were on parole and they were running. And I, at that point, asked if I could please be let out of the car. Clifton Talaferro, who was also in the car at the time, they stopped the car. He was driving. He stopped the car. And he pulled over to the side of the, pulled over to the side of the road and he stopped the car and he said, You can indeed get out of the car, but if you get out of the car you might not live before we drive away. So you have two choices. You can risk being shot in the back because you know too much about us and you can go to the police or you can stay in the car and go with us. I chose to stay in the car and go with us. Later on, you're arrested and charged with the um, yes. death of the vehicle. All right. On 41158, you're arrested in Ventura for uh, reproduction of a uh, driver's license. Yes, sir. You pled guilty of a $10 fine. On 62268, South Ukiah, you're arrested for possession of dangerous drug with a fire. Yes, sir. And uh, where did you get out of that? Uh, I believe it. I did three months in county jail. And was again put on probation. How old were you in 16th? I was 68. I was 20. On 59 you're arrested for uh, Los Angeles for violation of probation. You were released to the Mendocino Sheriff. Yes. 6769 uh, in South Ukiah, violation of probation. On 8 16 69, uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department for Grand Theft Auto. No disposition, so bullet disposition on that one. Uh, for what? Uh, auto theft. That's me. Grand theft auto. I don't, I don't know whether they got the charges on that one, sir. I don't remember. Uh, that was when they had issued the search warrant for Spawn's rent. Oh, and okay. okay. Search warrant right. was Right, and we were taken, I was taken to county jail, Los Angeles County Jail, held for, I believe, 72 hours in Bruce. So you were born in San Diego, California. Yes. Sir. And I'm the second child and only girl of Edward John Atkins and yes, the former Jeanette Jeff. Family moved to Santa Clara County and it was there where you grew up. It's alleged that both parents drank heavily because of uh, this. Your father changed his occupation frequently. Yes, sir. While the mother lived, the both parents worked and were able to provide an adequate, solidly middle class standard of living. Despite this, there was much internal strife in the family, both between the parents themselves and with their children. After the mother died of cancer, uh, when the, you were 13 years of age, the family... I was 14 and a half. Okay. Uh, father, the family broke up. The father staying away from the home for extended periods of time. Yes. And the children traveled from relative to relative in various foster homes. By then... Uh, Excuse me, I was never a person. I was never? No, sir. Okay. Any member of your family? Any um, I lived with my aunt for a while. Okay. And anybody else in your family? Yeah. Any in foster foster home? Home? No. No. I uh, see so you left high school when you were 18. Yes, sir. Did you finish high school? Yes, sir. What grade were you in? Uh, I was uh, in 11th grade. Did you ever finish up? Yes, sir. You went to San Francisco where you started uh, working in the magazine agency, but quit because of undesirable conditions. You uh, held various jobs, house cleaning, babysitting, working as a waitress, and just traveling around. Most of this period was spent in San Francisco where you frequently, uh, you frequented the Height Ashbury and Tenderloin and Broadway districts. It was during this period that you apparently met Manson and decided to join in and travel with the family. You had a little contact with your family since coming to Los Angeles County. And you lived in the uh, communal uh, agreement on Spawn Ranch in Chatsworth, except when living in, on the desert. You never been married? Before that? Yes. No, during that time, I had not ever been married. You married now? Yes, sir. You had one child? Yes, sir. Zizo? Flex? Yes. Born on October 7th, 1968. Where is he? I don't know. The uh, state of 
state of California um, no. custody away from me. Uh, he was adopted. He was adopted. Yes, sir. We're going to turn to Beverly uh, now. She'll be discussing your progress since your last Yes, yes. We're basically going to just go through what's happened since your last parole hearing in December of 1989. I wanted to check with you because basically you've, you've been disciplinary free since 82. However, there were a, a couple of uh, 128s that I wanted, would like to have you explain. The most recent one was in 1990, and that's failure to report to your education assignment. Yes, I had the flu. But aren't you supposed to get a... If you don't, the, the rules and the regulations in this institution, according to the medical department, is if you do not have a temperature or fever of 100 or above, you do not get a medical restriction. Yeah. Right? Um, the medical department ran its department during 1990, and I was literally too sick to get up to go to school. Even though you, and, and they based that just because you but didn't because have a temperature? Because I did not have temperature 100. Okay. And then, um, then we had another one in 1989 that was just before your last parole hearing, but I noticed the date that it was put in the file would not have been at that parole hearing. And that was, uh, again, failure to report to education assignment and data processing. Again, the same thing. Sick and capable of attending school. Okay, okay. So those are the only violations that you have in your file since your last hearing date. Excuse me, I have in my file two other 128s uh, that she had, two of the documentation of the, the prison. Um, sent me one was um, she received a 128 for actions in the visiting room on 72792 excuse me uh, that has been removed from my C file per an appeal no well that wasn't removed from my file and also no, wait, wait, hang, on, hang on hang on hold off on your comments until we get finished with this okay I'm, I'm going what is now currently in the C file and what we also have in our chronological report, two separate things, and, and there are no further uh, 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 disciplinary violations listed that we have before us. Um, I wanted to get into some of the, uh, you're still participating in the vocational data processing, or you, you did during this time? I completed vocational data processing. Okay. Um, you, um, yes, you completed 40 hours, and then you successfully completed 40 hours of training for trainers as a facilitator for the Breaking Barriers Program. Yes. And you, you participate in the Breaking Barriers Program. Yes, right. And now, are you uh, a facilitator in that program? Yes, and tell me, tell me what that has meant to you. Oh, that's, that's one of my joys. Um, I'm able to encourage people to get in touch with what it is they really want in life and helping them to learn how to do that. And it's unfortunate that most people, they might want something, but they don't know, they don't have the tools to acquire that. And in, in this kind of an environment, there are women who repeatedly um, have behavior patterns that cause them to do things that maybe they really don't want to do in their hearts, but they don't know that they have any alternatives. And as a breaking barriers facilitator, I'm able to show them that they do have alternatives, give them the tools to make goals, to set goals, and then show them how to fulfill those goals through education. And when you participated in this program, did you set goals for yes, yourself? Yes, I did. And are you working through yes, to obtain those goals? Okay. Um, you received um, some chronos, a thank you from Reverend Johnson for assistance in moving um, to the new interfaith chapel. Um, you've been commended by Officer C. Carter for efforts in assisting to expedite um, the level of cleanliness and maintenance necessary to maintain the flu apartments. What are the flu apartments? That were those are the family living unit apartments. And I believe since I um, utilize those apartments as part of a member of this community, it is also my responsibility to help maintain those apartments and make sure that they are um, clean, kept clean for other families that go back there. Okay. And you attend the lifers orientation meeting? Yes. How often do you 
the lifers or the lifers or long term mm -hmm. organization mm -hmm. as often as I can, which is not as frequent as I would like to because their meetings meet at the same time I have visits with my husband. Okay, and then you also were commended by Chaplain Johnson for the beautification of the CIW project. Mm -hmm. That was, was that the planting and... Yeah, uh, the grounds surrounding the chapel were in great need of care. And so I went out and I planted flowers and planted grass and just did what I could out. Okay. Um, you participated in New Beginnings. Yes. Yeah. What What did that program in? New Beginnings is uh, victim services oriented. It took me three years to get into the program. I had to wait three years to be able to participate in that. And in that I am an awesome facilitator. I had to go over to uh, the reception area, reception center. Uh, as new commitments are coming in, and we have an orientation where we show them from victim services on the effects of crime on victims of crime and we help raise the awareness level of the criminal of the cost of crime to the victims. The victims. Okay, then you've been participating in AA and NA. Um, when did you when did you start really uh, being involved in, in AA and NA? I got involved in AA and NA in 1984. Mm -hmm. and I was removed from close custody because AA and NA was an evening activity up until 1984. I was not allowed to participate. I went to AA and NA uh, because I was told to go. And originally, I was told that it was a requirement, so I went. I think it was maybe a year after I went to AA and NA that I really began to get involved in it and began to um, follow the process. And, and started this in 1984? In 1984, and about 1985, I got involved in 12 Steps and started really listening to what the 12 Steps were. Um, I don't think I did any of the 12 Steps until maybe 1986 when I met a sponsor. I found somebody who would sponsor me from the outside as a panel member. And she and I sat down. We had and she was able to come into the institution and we sat down. And I did my, what they call, fearless moral inventory and where I admitted to God and what a wonderful human being the exact nature of all my faults um, and became chairperson, I think, in 1985, perhaps 1986. Yes. Involved in it as, and served. At the board hearing in 1989, you indicated you were not attending because it was an absolute waste of time, that you didn't feel it was necessary to go and sit and listen to the same stories week after week. What, what had happened was um, in about 1987, 88, I got very disillusioned with um, AANA because I did listen to the same stories over and over and over again. And I left it and I thought, my the way I absorbed AANA is that you take a you take the twelve steps and you live them and you take it to the people in your community and you offer it. And I had thought that um, in giving the twelve steps away I would be able to maintain my own twelve steps. That sitting week after week was not the best way to go. And I didn't think it was a waste of time. I thought there was more to do. Wait, but you did testify at that time that you thought it was a waste of your time. I thought, I don't know that I said, did I say it was a waste of time? I think, as I recall that. Maybe I did. Um, and the parole board again encouraged me to go back. And I was defiant. I did not want to go back. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I said, I'll go back. And I didn't go back with a happy attitude. I did not want to sit every Wednesday night and listen to the same thing over and over again. I'll be really honest with you. I didn't want to go back. And I went back. And I have been So now when did you start back? I started back. It took me almost nine months because they had changed the policy at a and And they had a waiting list. They only lost 75 inmates in AANA, so it took me about nine months waiting to get back involved. And as I understand here, at this facility, they have two different programs. They have one that... There's four. Okay. There's Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, CODA, and Al-Anon. But then I understand there's a separate 12-step program, there too? Is, there is indeed a 12-step program, and I just finished a 12-step program, I think, about three months ago. I went through 12-step program, signed up again for it. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty much
much convinced that there's something there for me. Okay. I, for a while I thought, well, it's, I'm not drinking, I'm not using drugs, what's the use? It's kind of like uh, somebody who has cancer, if they go into remission, why go get chemotherapy over and over again? That's the kind of philosophy I, and thought pattern that I had, was that it was a waste of time because I'm not drinking, I'm not using drugs, nor do I want to. So why go sit and listen? to people talk about how they... But it's a lot it. different. It's, yes, it is. It's Tell me, what did, what did you use um, when LSD... During, during the commission? Yes, yeah, or during, prior, prior to your... I started drinking when I was 18. Um, and what did, what did you drink? Grasshoppers, because it was a sweet drink. A lot? A lot. Kahlua. Anything that was sweet, Singapore slings, um, any of the sweet drinks. Um, and I began to realize I was doing the same thing my parents did, and I hated what my parents did. And I hated what alcohol was doing to me. And I got involved in drugs, and this doesn't make any sense. But I got involved in drugs to get away from alcohol. Um, I was introduced to marijuana by two sailors. Did you smoke a lot of marijuana? Yeah, I did. And for how many years did you use? Uh, from 1966, late 66, until my incarceration. Okay, and then you used LSD. I used LSD. I used methadrine, which is pure speed. Um, I used Benny's which is another form of speed. I used cocaine. I, I only snorted it one time, but I did use it. I used um, hashish. So at the time you were using all these drugs, were you also involved with alcohol? Or no. Okay. But you, you do agree that you're an alcoholic? Oh, yes. And what about, are you a drug addict too? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. What's the I first? I have an addictive personality and, and struggle with that a lot. And though I'm not doing drugs and I'm not drinking, I smoked for many years and I had to put that addiction away. I struggle with um, coffee. I, I know coffee's not good for me and yet I drink coffee, you know. So I struggle with that and I do use the 12 steps. Okay. And what's the first step? To admit that I am powerless over alcohol, I am powerless over drugs. And have you come to accept that yeah. and believe that? Yeah. Okay. Not not easy, but yes. Okay. Um, you were also involved in building a new you. Yes. You got a certificate for yes. that. What is what is? Building a new you, uh, a prison fellowship, which is headed by Chuck Colson, came into the institution and. A friend of mine asked me if I would like to go, and I told her, sure, I very much believe in God, and thought that I would go ahead and go, and it was a two-day seminar, weekend seminar, that I participated in, like a Bible study and a seminar okay. to encourage people to trust in God. <laughs> I have this. Yeah. I have a certificate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Should I saw yeah, the certificate I in 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 the files here. And you're you're married. You got married in '87. Is that correct? Yes. How did you meet your husband? My husband had read um, two books. He had read Helter Skelter, and then he had read my book. And he was curious as to how somebody could make such a change from a person who would do what Helter Skelter depicted to somebody who could then confess Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, and he wrote to me um, out of curiosity, and I was very, very impressed with his letter. And he, um, after my first marriage, I didn't write many men, in fact, I didn't write any men for about five years. I didn't have anything to do with any kind of a relationship at all. I needed to get in touch with me. You said after your first marriage? Oh, you were married before then? Oh, Why you were... Mm -hmm. Your counselor, let me, uh, Mr. Salcedo, yes. has indicated, um, and this was prepared for this hearing, um, the documents from the previous hearing have been considered and the information appears valid. He indicates since your last appearance before the board in 1989 that your behavior has essentially remained the same and that you have been continuing in AA and NA. And then he goes on to indicate your auditory chronos that we have gone over. Um, 
further, he indicates that that um, you're. He, you followed the recommendations of the, from the last hearing by uh, attending self-help groups and remaining disciplinary free and working towards becoming responsible for your actions through personal growth. He does indicate, however, based on the seriousness of your commitment offense and the nature of the crimes, that you continue to be viewed as a high risk of threat to the society if released at this time. Um, and also notice the high notoriety status of the public interest in this case. And then when we get to the psychological report, which was very extensive, um, the psychologist indicates that you have made substantial progress during your 20 year, over 20 years of incarceration. Um, while the changes during the first decade of incarceration were drastic and covering a wide range of behavior and emotions, your changes in the third decade of incarceration are more subtle and more difficult to assess. He further mentions the Dr. Armstrong's 1989 uh, assessment that the subject of much notoriety and evaluation and this seems to be the most difficult part of your present situation to overcome. In other words, it's especially difficult for you to improve yourself and deal with your past as any uh, maturing process requires to become more insightful, composed, and self-possessed in the light of public scrutiny. <coughs> um, he says the interview resulted, in fact, I should look, is this, um, oh, yes. Uh, Dr. Klebel is... Klebel, yes. Klebel, okay. The um, interview resulted in the conclusion that inmate Atkins has made progress in accepting her part in the perpetration of the crime, in her guilt and remorse about her crimes, and in trying to understand what got her into the lifestyle and resulted in the horrendous events of the crimes. Um, but there is another factor preventing inmate Atkins Atkins further improvement. It is the extraordinary pressure resulting from those notorious and unprecedented crimes that makes it difficult for this inmate to further change and improve, especially when considered together with her personality characteristics. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. Well, I, I, I think what he's trying to indicate to you um, that I th and, and I got this feeling throughout the whole psychological report is that you're trying very hard while you're in the facility to open uh, uh, and um, let me get mistrust back and me mistrusting the others other yeah mistrusting me mm, um, the others relate to her presenting to you representing suspicion and mistrust authority problems and a difference in moral standards compared to normal responses these are some of the things that came out in the testing. I'm referring to the bottom of page three and the top of page four. Oh, okay. And then again, it goes on to, to indicate that you're overcompensating and attempting to overcome the present situation with elevated levels of activity and attempt being positive at all times. And under the discussion part, as pointed out above, inmate Atkins needs to learn to react less to the scrutiny of the public and to focus on her own development and maturation process. Additionally, this focus will help you to develop better relationships and become a less driven individual. Um, he, he further indicates that violence potential outside a controlled setting at the time of the crime was extreme and much greater than average and indicates now that it is substantially decreased. So, Mr. Chairman, that completes. And I'll call Mr. Nielsen to discuss uh, parole plans. Your parole plans are uh, best discerned from the 85 and 88 transcripts. I'll piece those together a little bit and then maybe you can offer some additional information. Well, basically, uh, as far as a system of support, you have a stepmother and a brother Steve with whom you maintain a continuing relationship, that is correct. Yes. Brother Michael, uh, there's been no relationship since a letter was sent to him in 84 and not and was returned. Um, my they contacted me through my counselor, um, and based on my brother Michael's behavior, and uh, this behavior was as it's evident to you in the letter he sent you. No, he didn't send me a letter. I wrote him. I see. So I this uh, was based on what he told the counselor. My decision. 
until not having I'm sorry. He, he he initiated a contact with the counselor, is that correct? Just this last year, yes sir. And he said something to the counselor. No, he was, just gave my counselor his phone number and asked me to call him. And so I called him. I in nineteen eighty four I wrote him to confront him after going through years of therapy as uh, a victim of my brother's uh, section, who sexually molested me, uh, to confront him. I never received a response from him at all about my past. My history has been put out there sufficiently and I want nothing to do with it, period. And I made a decision that uh, since Michael could not communicate with me, we could not resolve. I attempted to make um, uh, amends with him. He was not willing to make amends. He wanted nothing more than to exploit me. I decided he was not the type of an individual, brother or no, that I wanted in my life. And this occurred in the context of a phone conversation or conversation? Over two telephone calls. I had called him. And um, my younger brother, Stephen, um, had also been in contact with my brother Michael, in fact, my entire family, my brother, my sister-in-law, my grandmother, and my stepmother have all pretty much asked Michael to just leave us all alone. Michael was the initiator of this uh, sexual abuse, and not yes. Stephen, but Michael. Yes. Michael's my older brother. You've clarified that uh, regarding Michael, so as far as you're concerned, he's out of your life. He is out of my life. But Stephen uh, and you remain close, is yes. that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, the stepmother? My stepmother, uh, she is incapable of coming down to visit, but I do call her frequently, and we are in contact with each other. And your grandmother also? My grandmother is 94 years old, and um, not doing good. Mm -hmm. But I do have contact with her. She doesn't remember a lot. She remembers she has a granddaughter named Susan, and that's about all she remembers right now. The probably best support then that uh, that you have would be from your husband. My is husband correct? and his family, yes. James and you were married in 1987. Yes, sir. And I note that. Uh, our files are replete with a lot of uh, desires of confidentiality from yes. all parties of any interest yes. in this yes. For his, matter. Yes. Uh, I mean in terms of victim side as well yes. as, as yes. yours. I gather that generally remains a condition today as far as parole plans. Yes, sir. You desire certain confidentiality. Yes, but it could be stated that uh, parole plans include uh, these family members that we've mentioned. Yes, sir. And and I have a job. And you have a, uh, you, I, I've read about uh, what seems to be firm job offers, although because of the concern for confidentiality, there are no letters, but there are references. Right. And your counsel in the last hearing said if under oath he could, uh, you know, would provide that. Yes. Uh, is that correct? Absolutely. And uh, uh, the area of your expertise and ability is in computers and programming. And word processing. And word processing. Yes. So that would uh, remain one of your goals uh, upon being released. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm and also for the record, that if Miss Atkins, upon her release, would like to come work for me, I certainly could use her, and I will pay her. Well, that will be considered a firm on the record job offer. Yes. And, uh, I'm back in word processing, and they do offer two extensive paralegal courses, transcription courses, which I'm availing myself of presently, and will be hopefully applying to two universities that I attended here in the institution for a paralegal license through having done the courses. I don't think it's ever been done before, but I'm going to attempt uh, to see if I can get credited as a bona fide paralegal in the next year. Commissioner Bentley has referenced the recent psych reports, and they are throughout your file over the years, uh, mentioning different factors uh, that you have to various degrees dealt with in therapy and self-help. <clears throat> you spoke with some enthusiasm right now about breaking barriers. As far as a support system, do you see any need for other kinds of therapy or support 
uh, in, in free society. Absolutely. I think it would be very unwise of me to think that I could step from uh, a situation of incarceration for anywhere from two, three to four decades of incarceration immediately into a free society and be expect myself to acclimate automatically, I know I will need counseling. I have a therapist who is willing to work with me, work with my husband, who uh, on an outpatient basis uh, for counseling, that the world as it exists today is not the world that I left 23 years ago. Should I ever be allowed to re-enter free society, I'm sure it will be even markedly changed from today at that point in time, and I am going to need assistance. I attempt to, on a daily basis, maintain my contact with the world through, no, through news and magazines and education to know what's going on out there, but I have no uh, uh, delusions of grandeur that I can walk out here tomorrow and not go through some changes. I know I'm going to need help. The recent psych report, and I'll want to ask some questions about it later on in the hearing, uh, speak about normal person, and you're striving to be that. As to the notoriety that necessarily visits this crime and your participation therein, have you come up with any strategies to deal with that free society? Uh. Well, first of all, I, I don't think I'm going to walk out there and live by it under my maiden name. I will take my husband's name, as is my right as his wife. Uh, we do not plan on being uh, famous people. I don't want to give interviews. I don't want to write books. I just would very much like to pick up life and move on from there as a private law-abiding citizen of this country. Um, I'm not sure that um, normalcy, as I understand, I think I'm a normal person today, but I don't think that the public, I don't think people who view me through the eyes of society looking at the crime view me as a normal person today. And that's the quandary I'm in. Um, Dr. Cobell and I talked extensively about how in the world do I sit when I have people scrutinizing me and I know my heart's motives are right. I know my morality is intact. I know my ethics are intact. But I have people who look at me with disdain, who look at me with bitterness, who look at me with hatred, justifiably so based on the events of 23 years ago. But they're looking at me through a telescope of time instead of looking at me today. And that's where my frustration is. If people could just see me and know me, and I, have, and I have people that, that are capable of doing that and that do do that and who reinforce um, and support me in being a normal person. I have friends 